Hello, welcome to the Friday, June 19th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Jan today discovered an interesting bug in Microsoft Outlook that could potentially make phishing a little bit easier. The problem here is if you have an image tag within your email, so it's an HTML email, there's an image tag that's empty. So it's just simple, less than IMG greater than. This image tag is inside an a tag with href pointing to an untrusted website. So by itself, that wouldn't really be all that dangerous because this image doesn't really exist and it's sort of impossible to click on that link. Now, the tricky part here is if this link is followed by another normal link, then if you forward the email, Outlook will swap the link and uh, will insert the untrusted link where the trusted link used to be. So the risk here, which isn't huge, but it's, it's there is that uh, if you forward an email, you think the email is harmless, the link looked good, you forward the email, but then by forwarding the email, it's actually being rewritten. Now it's not really clear why Outlook does that. Uh, my Guess is that I've seen similar issues uh, with HTML email where the mail reader, in this case Outlook, wanted to make sure that the email you're sending actually is properly formed. So uh, this empty image tag is invalid and uh, then Outlook essentially fixed it for us. Uh, this actually sometimes is done to prevent cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and such uh, because it's really hard to validate the HTML that's not properly formed. So a lot of the libraries that check for cross-site scripting will first check for invalid HTML, remove it, fix it, and uh, then validate the email. So it could be an artifact that's sort of caused by this logic. I've seen this in other uh, webmail-based systems, usually before uh, Yahoo, for example, had an issue like this where actually cleaning up uh, the broken link caused the cross-site scripting. Now, this issue is something that Jan just ran into yesterday. Of course, earlier this week, he had his webcast uh, where he talked about uh, several issues like this that make phishing easier. I'll post the link to the recording again uh, because the live webcast was a little bit uh, messed up. Uh, people weren't able to join the room, but the archive is available now. And Cisco today released a number of updates. What's sort of noteworthy here is that first of all, there are updates for WebEx clients and the vulnerability being addressed here could lead to code execution. So certainly something you want to pay attention to. And secondly, Cisco now has a page with devices that are made by Cisco and potentially vulnerable to the Ripple 20 vulnerabilities. These are the Trek IP stack vulnerabilities that I talked about earlier this week. And this vulnerability will certainly keep on giving for a while or this set of vulnerabilities because it does affect a very large number of different devices, not just Cisco's. And then we have a new unauthenticated and unpatched remote code execution vulnerability in a large number of Netgear routers. The vulnerability was discovered independently by the Serade initiative as well as by Adam Nichols of cybersecurity firm Krim. And yes, Adam has also released a working exploit for this vulnerability. Well, it's actually pretty easy to exploit this vulnerability. It's a simple parameter. I believe it's a part of the firmware update. It's just the name, the file name for the firmware that's being copied into a limited size buffer without any length check. So really a very classic, simple buffer overflow and as such, uh, really not all that difficult uh, to exploit. The exploit released by Adam Nichols does start a Telnet server listening on port 8888 and not requiring any login, but the server is running as root. 
Netgear has been notified by both researchers. As far as I know, uh, the survey initiative has sort of a timeline that they notified them at the beginning of January. And well, uh, the 120 day grace period now ran out, which is why they're going public. Well, and that's it for today. Remember, on Tuesday, 1 p.m. Eastern, we do have this two-hour workshop where we're talking about, well, how to use the Internet Storm Center data and how to set up a honeypot. So uh, if you want to join us, uh, don't really need much. Yes, if you have a Raspberry Pi or an Ubuntu virtual machine, then I can walk you through setting up the honeypot. But in particular, to use the data, all you really need is, well, some kind of Unix system to play with a couple scripts uh, that I'm uh, going to provide you. That's it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.